The Taming of the Shrew was written very early in William Shakespeare's career. Shrew is an old-fashioned and sexist term for an ill-tempered woman, and such characters were often the butt of comic literature in Shakespeare's time. Readers, or audiences viewing performances of the play, will note that ships sailing in trade and music are the central motifs that pop up in the dialogue and context surrounding the storylines. Nautical imagery also recurs throughout The Taming of the Shrew. Since many of the play's characters are merchants or merchant's sons, allusions to maritime trade help to connect the activities of marriage and commerce. In Shakespeare's time, cities throughout Europe depended greatly on ocean-going trade for their prosperity. Some, such as Venice, were major commercial ports. Others, including Padua, lay inland, but were still reliant on shipping to get their wares to foreign markets. For an individual merchant, a ship was an important investment, and the loss of a vessel could spell disaster. Music reveals character traits both in dialogue and performance cues. In the induction, soft music signals Christopher <gasps> Sly's transition from his old life as a tinker to his new life as a nobleman. Hortensio poses as a music teacher in order to have the best shot at courting Bianca. Bianca and Catherine respond very differently to music, offering clues to their personalities. Hortensio's rhyming lesson in Act 3, Scene 2 is an extended pun on a medieval system known as the gamut, in which every note in the musical scale had a name. This arrangement is the ancestor of the modern do re mi system used in choirs and classrooms. Though it may seem unnecessarily complicated by today's standards, the gamut was common knowledge to educated Elizabethans. The Taming of the Shrew begins with a pair of introductory scenes, the induction, outside the main action of the play. In the first scene, a nobleman finds the beggar Christopher Sly passed out in an alehouse and decides to play a practical joke on him. He orders his men to have Sly bathed, groomed, and dressed as a mighty lord, then carried to the finest bedroom in the lord's manor. Christopher Sly wakes up, the servants convince him he's actually a nobleman and that his previous life of poverty was a delusional dream. He protests at first, but is then completely taken in by their ruse. Then the actual play begins. In Act 1, Lucenzio, a bookish young man from Pisa, arrives in Padua to study. While looking for a place to stay, he happens to overhear an argument between Baptista Minola, a wealthy Paduan, and Gremio and Hortensio, who are suitors to Baptista's daughter Bianca. Baptista announces that he will only allow Bianca to be courted when a husband has been found for her older sister Catherine. Although they're rivals, Hortensio and Gremio decide to work together to find such a man, but they fear nobody will take up the challenge. Fortunately for them, Petruccio of Verona has just arrived in town looking for a rich wife. Lucenzio and Hortensio plan to disguise themselves as tutors and woo Bianca under the pretext of teaching her. Tranio, Lucenzio's servant, agrees to switch places with his master so Lucenzio will be able to carry out his scheme. Act two consists of a single long scene. Hortensio and Lucenzio, now disguised as Litio and Cambio, respectively, visit the Minola residence to woo Bianca. Hortensio is sent to teach music to Catherine, who whacks him over the head with a lute. Petruccio shows and wants a hefty dowry from Baptista Minola for marrying Catherine. After a long exchange of insults with Catherine, Petruccio tells Baptista Minola that the match is made, despite Catherine wanting nothing to do with him. Baptista excitedly agrees to the wedding the very next Sunday. He then addresses Gremio and the disguised Tranio. His daughter Bianca will wed the man who can best provide for her if she's widowed. Tranio, posing as Lucenzio, wins the contest by promising huge wealth to Bianca, but Baptista Minola insists on meeting Lucenzio's father first. In Act 3, Lucenzio and Hortensio, in their disguises, give lessons to Bianca, revealing their identities in the process. She neither encourages nor discourages them, though she seems to favor Lucenzio. The next scene takes place on Petruccio and Catherine's wedding day, with Baptista and his guests anxiously waiting for the groom to show up. When Petruccio arrives, he does everything he can to make the wedding a disaster and embarrass the bride. In fact, he shows up on one of the key symbols of the play, Petruccio's horse. He arrives late to his own wedding, dressed comically and riding a graphically described grotesque, weak horse, barely able to walk, the equivalent of a car with two flat tires, no muffler, and mismatched doors taken from the junkyard. 
Clearly, Petruccio does not just happen to have a diseased, broken-down horse waiting in his stable. This gesture reflects Petruccio's cavalier attitude toward his bride, his friends, and his future father-in-law. In his quest to tame Catherine, Petruccio is willing to make himself look ridiculous, even clownish. Petruccio's mad behavior is beginning to alarm the other men, even those who originally applauded his efforts to domesticate Catherine. After the ceremony, Petruccio announces he and Catherine must depart for Verona, missing their wedding feast in the process. She protests, but Petruccio gives her no choice but to leave immediately. In Act 4, at home in Verona, Petruccio takes the taming experiment to new extremes. He deprives Catherine of food and sleep, argues loudly with the servants, and generally makes her as miserable as possible, all while pretending that he does it out of concern for her. The dress is another major symbol of the play that shows up here. After all, Petruccio begins his campaign against Catherine the moment he meets her. His plan is to contradict Catherine at every turn, praising her for virtues she doesn't have. This absurd behavior reaches its climax here, when Petruccio has a tailor bring in a costly gown cut in the latest style. Just as Petruccio expects, Catherine absolutely adores the dress. He then proceeds to find fault with the way the sleeves are cut. In fact, he throws an absolute fit, berating the tailor as a flea and a nit, and threatening him with physical violence. When the tailor realizes he will not be able to collect payment for the gown, he packs it up and quickly leaves the house. The dress, which Catherine loves but cannot have, is a visual symbol of how cruel Petruccio has become. By fixating on such a small detail, he's managed to turn an ordinary meeting into an upsetting spectacle, all while denying Catherine something she clearly desires. Catherine is already hungry and sleep deprived when the scene begins, but after Petruccio's argument with the tailor, she understands there's no hope of reasoning with him. By the time the two head back to Padua, Catherine is utterly submissive to Petruccio, fearing what her husband will do if she contradicts him even slightly. In the meantime, the disguised Tranio has found a man who will pretend to be Lucenzio's father. And in Act 5, Tranio, still disguised as Lucenzio, invites Battista Benola to his house to finalize the marriage contract with Bianca. Lucenzio's real father, Vincenzio, arrives in Padua and attempts to visit his son, but is nearly arrested as an imposter. Lucenzio and Bianca, having just been married, save Vincenzio from the police in the nick of time and explain the deception to Baptista Minola. The closing scene takes place at Baptista Minola's house at the wedding feast of Lucenzio and Bianca. Here, Petruccio <laughs> reveals to the other men the marvelous transformation in Catherine's behavior. Baptista is so stunned by the change in his daughter that he gives Petruccio a huge sum of money, another dowry to another daughter. Catherine gives a long emotional speech about the role of a wife, urging women to be submissive to their husbands. Petruccio applauds and bids his fellow revelers good night. Love it or hate it, the Taming of the Shrew's themes have made this one of Shakespeare's most talked about plays all the way to modern times. Disguise and deception is one of these main themes. Three out of Bianca's four suitors employ some kind of disguise, either to get close to her or to fool her father. Lucenzio and Hortensio both masquerade as tutors. Tranio not only impersonates Lucenzio, but tricks a merchant into posing as Lucenzio's father. Petruccio's taming of Catherine makes use of a different, crueler sort of trickery. False promises he has no intention of keeping. From their first meeting onward, Petruccio dangles before Catherine the promise of a lavish lifestyle. These luxuries seldom materialize, and when they do, Petruccio snatches them away before Catherine can enjoy them. Even though she sees through Petruccio's behavior, Catherine is gradually worn down by her inability to trust her madcap husband. Gender roles may be the most important theme. There's no getting around it. The Taming of the Shrew reflects, and maybe even celebrates, the widespread sexism of its time. The central premise of the play is that a woman who is too assertive, argumentative, or uncooperative needs and deserves to be tamed. Some scholars have argued that this theme is presented in jest, and Catherine's closing monologue should be read sarcastically. Still, neither Petruccio's friends nor his father-in-law speak out too strongly against his actions. To them, apparently, the taming experiment is acceptable in principle, even if Petruccio carries it too far. 
Shakespeare, it might be argued, is not endorsing this viewpoint, but merely presenting the way things were or commenting on an unfortunate social reality. In Shakespeare's later plays, characters as misogynistic as Petruchio tend to be either villains or tragically misguided heroes. But The Taming of the Shrew is a comedy, and it ends with a celebration. For Petruchio, the play's ending is definitely a happy one. In the world of the play, marriage is a property exchange between husbands and father-in-laws, a kind of game which Petruchio clearly wins. Catherine, married against her will to a tyrannical husband, is almost certainly the loser. And Petruchio wins because of his willingness to treat Catherine like an animal to be domesticated. By the end of the play, Catherine is so thoroughly changed that she gives a lecture on wifely obedience to the other women at the wedding. Wealth Conquers All is another theme. It's no surprise that a play about fortune hunting suitors would be filled with images of gold and jewels. Baptista Minola treats his daughter's suitors like contractors bidding to complete a job, and he offers Petruchio a bonus payment for taming Catherine so well. Gremio gives a lavish description of his home in Padua, which is adorned with all kinds of gold and silver furnishings. Tranio, who's bidding on behalf of his master Lucenzio, names the exact sum Bianca will receive if she marries him. Hortensio, Bianca's other suitor, uses wealth imagery to express his admiration for Bianca's intelligence, personality, and physical beauty. Nonetheless, Hortensio regards Bianca as a treasure and the jewel of my life. While it may not be Shakespeare's most famous or beloved play, The Taming of the Shrew has frequently been adapted for film and television. Kiss Me Kate in 1953, a 1967 version starring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, and the 1999 teen comedy 10 Things I Hate About You, as well as the 2009 television series of the same name. <laughs>